Hello and welcome to session five of our eight-part series, Praying with the Gospel of John. And uh, tonight we're going to focus on the phrase that John uses repeatedly here, or Jesus uses repeatedly in John's Gospel, uh, the phrase, I am, and the importance of that phrase uh, in the fourth Gospel. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We began our series in session one looking at the prologue of John's Gospel. And in the prologue, John uncovers the mystery of who Jesus is and why he has come to live on the earth. Uh, we learn that Jesus is the Word, and the Word has existed from the beginning with God, and the Word was God. And uh, through the Word, uh, God created all things, and so um, the Word is the source of all creation. Nothing came into being um, except for uh, uh, the Word's initiative. Uh, then we read in verse 14 of the prologue, uh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It took on human form in the person of Jesus, uh, showing forth God's glory, full of grace and truth, the Gospel writer tells us. And we learn that uh, because Jesus is from above, because he has had this existence with the Father, um, in the spiritual realm uh, uh, and now has come to earth, he is especially equipped to help those of us who live below uh, on the earth and who don't always see things clearly. He is uniquely positioned to reveal God to us. So John says, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So Jesus comes into the world to reveal to us a God who is a God of love. And he is sent into the world so that those who believe in him may find eternal life. Now, throughout the Gospel, we also said we see Jesus' oneness with the Father. He makes it clear that he has not come into the world to do his own will, but to do the will of the one who sent him. And he says that his words are not his own, they're the words that the Father gives him. He acts on behalf of the Father, and he says he can do nothing apart from the Father. He abides in the Father, and the Father abides in him. And he goes so far to say, uh, uh, the Father and I are one. So we see a, a Jesus who is in close and intimate communion with the Father. He abides in the Father, the Father abides in him, and this intimate connection and communion is sustained by his prayer life and, uh, and by the, uh, the words and the deeds that he gives which come from the Father. Uh, he's simply manifesting the Father's love in the world through his words and actions. So the Father and I are one. There's an intimate uh, union and connection uh, with Jesus and his Father. And Jesus invites us to be in the same connection, intimate connection with him. And that everything that we should do or say would flow out of this intimate union that we have with him. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. 
And uh, so uh, uh, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Everything that we do then will flow from our connection with him. And uh, um, so this is, this is an important theme in John and an important image, uh, which is uh, very important to understanding John's purpose. It's also important to understanding the opposition which Jesus faces. Not everyone receives his word or believes in him, and some are opposed to him. And one of the reasons they're opposed to him is that his identification of himself with God and with God's purposes alarms the Pharisees and the scribes who accuse him of blasphemy, of making himself equal to God. So all of this talk about the Father and I are one, and his union with the Father um, uh, sets him up for these charges from his opponents that he is committing blasphemy by equating himself with God. We have seen throughout the uh, early stages of the Gospel, uh, we see the opposition to Jesus growing uh, throughout the Book of Signs, the first half of the Gospel. And then following the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the opposition um, uh, become, uh, tips to a, a, a new place where uh, they are seeking the death of Jesus. Um, so they charge him with blasphemy, with making himself equal to God. And one of the trigger points uh, that causes this charge of blasphemy is Jesus' frequent use of the phrase, I am. Because I am, uh, I am the good shepherd, I am the, uh, the bread of life, I am the light of the world. Each time he uses that phrase, I am, it's recalling something that uh, uh, um, brings out a visceral reaction on the part of the Jews. Because this phrase uh, in Greek, it's ego I may, ego I may, I am. This is the same phrase that God used uh, to describe his own name uh, and character to Moses. You remember Moses uh, early on was a shepherd and was taking care of his sheep in the wilderness when God spoke to him from a burning bush. And from the burning bush, Moses was told to go to Egypt and to liberate the people of Israel from the Egyptians who uh, held them uh, captive. And Moses uh, protested uh, the idea. He didn't think he was up to the task of challenging Pharaoh or of uh, gaining freedom for the Israelite people, uh, delivering them from their slavery. And so uh, he protests, and, uh, and then at one point in the story, this is a story in Exodus, uh, uh, Moses says to God, uh, who shall I say sent me? <laughs> you know, um, how will I convince not only Pharaoh, but how will I convince the Israelites that I've been sent by God? <laughs> uh, what name shall I give them? What shall I say? And God says, uh, uh, I am that I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. So uh, Moses says, who shall I say has sent me? What name shall I give to the people? This is in Exodus chapter 3. God answers, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the people, I am has sent me to you. Uh, so in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, these words are ego I may, and this is the same phrase that's used in the Greek New Testament by Jesus. So in the fourth gospel, Jesus uses this phrase repeatedly to describe himself and to explain his mission. There are seven uh, I am sayings in the Gospel of John, which will indicate on the screen here. Uh, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, 7, I am the door for the sheep. John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. John 11, 
verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. And John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So in this session, we'd like to look at uh, each of these. We'll take them one by one, each of these I am sayings, and try to reflect a little bit on uh, what it shows us about Jesus' identity and about his purpose uh, for being in the world. So the first one, uh, I am the bread of life, this uh, saying occurs in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. And the chapter opens with the account of Jesus' miracle, his sign, as John would call it, uh, in which he feeds 5,000 people with just a, a couple of loaves of bread and five fish. And this miracle of this feeding of the multitude uh, uh, with this small amount of bread uh, uh, begins a period of discussion. So after John describes the sign itself, what happened, and how the disciples uh, distributed the food, and how people were satisfied and uh, filled, then he goes on in the rest of the John 6, there is a lengthy discussion, which is meant to um, kind of further uh, explain and explore the meaning of this uh, miracle, of this sign. And so in the discourse that follows uh, this miracle, Jesus, first of all, likens himself uh, to the bread from heaven, uh, which was uh, called manna in the Old Testament. You remember the Old Testament story, and once the people were set free from their captivity in Egypt, Moses led them for 40 years through the wilderness. And at times they were faced with uh, the challenge of finding food in the wilderness. And the people complained, and uh, Moses prayed to God, and God said, I will furnish them with bread from heaven, which the people called manna. It was a strange substance that appeared in the morning on the ground, and they could gather it up and use it to bake cakes and to uh, nourish themselves. So this provision, this miraculous provision of, of food in the desert for the people of Israel is the basis for, for this, um, uh, this teaching. Now Jesus is saying, uh, just like uh, God provided manna from heaven to feed and nourish and sustain the people of Israel, so I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread of life that God has given to feed and nourish and strengthen you. The people are captivated by the sign of this bread and uh, enjoy... <laughs> the miracle of uh, Jesus providing uh, food for such a large crowd. But as is so often the case in John's Gospel, it seems like the people are on this lower level and they understand things in very concrete, practical ways. And they are missing the point that Jesus is actually talking about something higher. Uh, he's talking about some a spiritual reality in which he has been sent from heaven in order to be the food uh, for their nourishment. But he's talking in a spiritual sense, in a kind of a supernatural sense. He's not talking about continually feeding them with free meals, uh, which uh, seems to be what they're looking for. So they're impressed, they are in, so impressed that they try to uh, make him king, but uh, he wants nothing to do with this. He is talking about uh, a spiritual reality um, the gift of eternal life, which he is going to uh, give to them as their bread and as their food and nourishment. The uh, discussion that follows the sign in the beginning of John chapter 6 is divided into several sections, and each section Jesus uh, claims get to be more and more outrageous in the minds of the Jews and of his audience. First, in the first section, he's claiming to be the bread of heaven himself. And he says, uh, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of heaven, which comes down from above. And uh, he recalls the mystery of the manna in the wilderness. 
how God sustained the people in their wanderings in the wilderness with this uh, flaky substance that would appear on the ground in the morning. And people could gather it up and make it into cakes and, uh, and eat it. So uh, people uh, uh, experienced this bread coming from heaven, as it were, which fed them day after day after day. Jesus now equates himself and ties back to that story uh, from the book of Exodus and says, uh, I am the bread of life, just like the manna that you received uh, in the wilderness. So I have been sent from above to be your food and nourishment. Uh, then he goes on to uh, um, say that this bread is the source of a new life and that unless they eat this bread and drink this cup, they do not have life in them. And this, this all begins to get uh, uh, incomprehensible for his Jewish audience when he starts to talk about this bread as his body and uh, the wine as his blood and says that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to receive this heavenly life. We see more and more of the Jews in the audience turning away from him and leaving him. This becomes a hard saying and not many can accept it. What uh, scholars will say is going on here is John, of course, is using Eucharistic imagery. Uh, by this time, the Johannine community would be regularly celebrating Eucharist together. Eucharist would be their primary act of worship together. And so the breaking of the bread and the, and the sharing of the wine in the, in the Lord's Supper or the Communion or the Eucharist was the central part of their worship. And so they, they are familiar, the, John's readers are, are familiar with this. They uh, participate in this feast every week and understand its, symbol, its, uh, its symbolism. But uh, in the story, uh, um, people are turned away by this and don't understand what he means by saying they must eat his flesh. So uh, at the end of the story, there's a very touching scene where Jesus turns to his disciples and says, will you also leave? And, um, and Peter makes a wonderful confession. He says, no, Lord, uh, to whom else uh, can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So that's the, that's the origin of this first saying, I am the bread of life. Jesus comparing himself with the man in the wilderness and claiming to be the food and nourishment that people need for this new life that Jesus is bringing them uh, from the Father. The second image is, I am the light of the world. And this image appears in John chapter 8. It's interesting to think about the context of this saying because this saying takes place during the festival of booths. The festival of the booths also recalled these journeys through the wilderness. And in this festival, uh, the Jewish people would build small huts or booths outside of their homes. And they would uh, eat and sleep there during the festival rather than in the comfort of their homes. It was to recall this time in the wilderness when they didn't have solid homes and they were moving, uh, uh, sleeping in tents and, and uh, traveling through the wilderness. So in order to recall that time, they, they, they built a little makeshift booths for a few days and they slept uh, in those as re to recall their journey and how God had sustained them through the wilderness. Also remember during that, that story of God leading them through the wilderness, there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that, uh, that um, accompanied the people in their journeys and in which God was present. God's glory was present in those clouds uh, that were leading them, in that light that was leading them. So part of the festival of the uh, booths uh, that they celebrated, not only were the make 
makeshift booths uh, uh, put up. But there was also a, a festival in which these huge candelabras would be filled uh, with with wood and set aflame. And so there were these huge uh, uh, fires that were illuminating the whole city. And so for Jesus to, in the midst of this festival, with its powerful symbol of light, that light representing the presence of God, the glory of God among them, and recalling their journey through the wilderness. For Jesus to then say, I am the light of the world, he is equating himself with that light and, uh, and claiming uh, that the glory of God is uh, dwelling in him uh, and uh, that he is uh, the presence of God among God's people. And so it's a powerful claim and uh, it's recalling uh, important prophecies about the Messiah. You remember that Isaiah said the Messiah would be a light to the nations and the glory of God's people, Israel. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And so there's this expectation for the Messiah uh, to be a light coming into the world. And Jesus claims here that he is that light. He is light that comes into the world and the darkness of the world cannot overcome it. Um, so we saw that uh, theme introduced in the prologue and it's a theme that carries on through this gospel where uh, Jesus coming is equated to light uh, coming into the world uh, to illumine and enlighten. The third image that we have is I am the door for the sheep. We talked about this in our last session. Uh, so we won't spend a lot of time on it, but he likening himself to the gate of the sheepfold. And Jesus is saying that he provides access to the sheepfold for the sheep that belong to him and that know his voice. And he also provides access to the sheepfold for the shepherds who will care for the sheep. And he uh, keeps out the thieves and the bandits and the hirelings who uh, uh, don't know the sheep and don't care for the sheep, uh, uh, who are just interested in, in profiting from the sheep or stealing them. And so uh, as the gate, he not only uh, swings open to welcome the sheep, but he also swings open to welcome the good shepherds who will take care of the sheep and to keep out those false shepherds. Um, of course, these uh, images are meant to contrast his own uh, shepherding with the uh, shepherding of the Pharisees, which is seen as uh, false um, and uh, uh, ineffective um, uh, leadership. Then in the fourth, uh, uh, we have the symbol of I am the good shepherd um, in John chapter 10 as well. And here uh, we spent time on this image last week as well. So we'll just uh, refresh your memory that Jesus compares himself as the good shepherd with, uh, with people who are thieves and bandits and who uh, climb into the sheepfold by another way in order to steal. Uh, he says he is the good shepherd. He is not only... Um, uh, the good shepherd who enters by the gate is recognized by the gatekeeper and is welcomed by the sheep who recognize his voice. But he's not only uh, known to the sheep and they know him, he knows them, he calls them all by name, uh, they respond to his voice, there's this intimate connection between him and the sheep, but he is also the one who lays down his life for the sheep. The hireling uh, runs away at the first sign of danger, but the good shepherd, because of his commitment and love for the sheep, is willing to risk even his life to protect them and to care for them. A powerful image for us to reflect on and meditate on. The fifth image that we have in these I am sayings is I am the resurrection and the life. And this saying comes from John chapter 11, another story which we visited in a previous, uh, uh, previous session. This is the story of the raising of Lazarus. 
So you remember that Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, but he waits a couple of days and then he proceeds uh, to Bethany where he finds out that Lazarus has died and he's been in the tomb. Uh, uh, Martha comes out and she's very concerned. She wishes that he would have arrived sooner and he possibly could have prevented uh, uh, Lazarus's death. But uh, Jesus promises her that Lazarus will rise again. And Martha says, oh, I know that he will rise in the resurrection of the dead at the last day. But Jesus then claims, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And as he will soon show, he has power over death. He'll raise Lazarus uh, from the tomb. So Jesus claims he is the resurrection and the life. That is, he is able to provide everlasting life to those who believe in him. Those who believe in me, he says, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he says to Martha, do you believe this? And Martha confesses her faith and uh, that he is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And then as, uh, as evidence of his power over the grave, Jesus calls forth Lazarus from the tomb and uh, uh, restores him to life and to the company of his sisters. So this declaration, I am the resurrection and the life, takes place in the midst of this, his most powerful sign, and uh, the one that eventually turns his opponents against him. The sixth sign is found later in John chapter 15, among Jesus' final discourse with his disciples, in which he draws on the image of a vine and its branches. Jesus likens himself to a vine, and he likens his followers to the branches of the vine. He says that uh, just, as, uh, just as Jesus abides in the Father, and the Father abides in him, that life-giving connection through which all his words and his uh, actions uh, flow from, uh, the same connection he's offering to his disciples. He says, I'll, I have the vine, you get the branches, my life flowing through you uh, will bear fruit. But he says, unless you are connected with this vine, uh, the branches by themselves can't bear fruit. And if they're cut off from the vine, they won't be able to produce any fruit. So the importance of remaining connected with him, of this intimate union with him, of sharing in his life, of abiding in him, letting him abide in them, is crucial to their, to their own fruitfulness. Um, and so this is a powerful image also for us to reflect on and to uh, understand the nature of our connection with him. And the final uh, the I am statement is found in John chapter 14. And uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Uh, they are soon going to be separated from him. And um, he says that he is going uh, to his father's house where there are many mansions. And he tells them, I go to prepare a place for you. But the disciples don't understand what he's talking about. And they claim that they don't know where he's going and they don't know the way. Uh, they don't know how to follow him. What way is he, is he going and how will they follow him? Uh, he's talking about separating from them and leaving them. And so Jesus um, uh, says to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now we've encountered this way before. Um, some theologians say the way that Jesus is referring to is, is the way that he himself is shown. Uh, in our last session, we talked about the good, uh, the good shepherd uh, laying down his life for the sheep. 
And uh, we also talked about the imagery of the foot washing in which Jesus takes up the servant's role. And, uh, and so there, the image of the shepherd who lays down his life, who gives up his life uh, in order uh, uh, to, to produce life, like the seed falling in the ground in order to bear fruit. This seems to be the way that Jesus follows, not only his way of laying down his life in order that it may be fruitful, but the way that he's commanding to his, his followers is saying, you too are being encouraged to lay down your lives for others. And uh, through this loving service, you will find your lives being uh, increasingly fruitful. And so the way of Jesus is this way of dying in order to rise, of emptying in order to uh, be fruitful. Uh, he also claims to be the truth and the life. We, we've seen some references already to the life, uh, beginning in the prologue. Uh, Jesus says he is the life that's coming into the world that is like a light. Um, but what does he mean when he says he's the truth? The Greek word for truth, aletheia, has a double meaning. And it means, first of all, truth as distinguished from falsehood. So something that's true as opposed to something that's false. But there's a second meaning in which uh, the truth is something that is real and genuine as opposed to something that is unreal or counterfeit. And so Jesus, uh, in saying that he is the truth, is not only talking about his, he's true and what he says is true as opposed to being false, but he's also talking about being genuine and uh, being real as opposed to being unreal or counterfeit. For John, the truth is something more than uh, just intellectual. It's not just a matter of believing something to be true, but it's also something that has moral implications. So it's not something simply to know, but it's also something to do. Uh, for John, the truth can be acted out. It can be, uh, it can be done. Uh, so it's not just something in the intellect that's known uh, or assented to, but it's something that is done, uh, performed. Uh, so John says things like this, John 3, 21, he who does what is true comes to the light. He does what is true comes to the light. And in 1 John 1, verse 6, we read, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not have the truth. So truth is not just intellectual truth, but truth is also a thing that enables us to live a good life, a moral life and an upright life. Truth and goodness are very closely associated. So to say that Jesus is the truth is also to say that he is incarnate goodness. He is real and authentic, and he is the perfect pattern of life as it should be lived. And then finally, we have Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the originator of life, as we saw in the, in the prologue of the gospel. Uh, uh, all things came into being through him, and without him nothing was, was created. So he is the giver of life, uh, and the, the part of the creative process that brought life into being. But he is also the giver of eternal life. He's the giver of life, and he's the recreator of life. And when Jesus offers us eternal life, he's offering us something more than just an existence that continues forever. Um, it's something more than just, oh, you, you'll never die again. You will continue to exist. The eternal life that Jesus is bringing us is nothing less than the life of God. And so there's a sense that to those who believe and who open their hearts to it, this uh, life of God will come in uh, to their hearts and take possession of them already, right now. Uh, they don't have to wait for death or for an afterlife 
to receive this gift of eternal life. But the eternal life that Jesus is bringing is something that, for John at least, begins in the moment, begins right now. And we can begin to enjoy this life. This is why Jesus says in John 10, verse 10, I have come to bring life and to, and to bring abundant life. And he means it to be a life that's lived right now. It is the life of God. So, um, so these images, all of these sayings, uh, which share the Greek phrase, ego, I may, I am, all of these phrases are fruitful um, um, places for our prayer. And we can use each one of them to reflect on uh, what does this show us about Jesus? What does this tell us about his character, about who he is, his identity and about what he does, what's in, what his mission is. And, and I think also it's important to think um, these uh, I am saying can be a key to us to open our understanding and perhaps broaden our understanding of what the salvation is that Jesus is offering to us and bringing into the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we might have eternal life. And what is this life like? These images can show us something of what God wants to give us and how God wants to save us. Jesus says, I came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world could be saved. So how do these, uh, uh, how do these images speak to salvation? Now, many of us grew up with an understanding of salvation as being related to the forgiveness of sins. We said uh, we asked forgiveness for our sins, God assured us of forgiveness, and we have been saved uh, because we trusted in Jesus for our salvation. And we mean it primarily in terms of having been sinful people and worthy of the penalty of sin, but now having been forgiven and restored to life by uh, uh, Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. But this is only one part of salvation, and these images, I think, can open us up to, to other understandings of salvation that are just as important. For example, if we say, I am the bread of life, let's take that saying, we can imagine that this is a word of hope for people who are hungry. Uh, who are hungry for meaning or hungry for affection or belonging, uh, hungry for love, uh, whatever the hunger is that we're experiencing in this life, Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. I want to come and fill that hunger, satisfy that hunger. And so uh, it may not just be a matter of someone is in need of forgiveness of sins, but of someone who is hungering for something real, something meaningful, and Jesus coming and saying, I am the bread that will nourish you and satisfy this hunger. Likewise, the light of the world may be a promise that's meaningful to people who are trapped in darkness and uh, may be trapped, for example, in the darkness of, uh, of addiction or of uh, um, uh, uh, some terrible illness or malady, uh, they feel trapped and caught in this uh, place and unable to escape it. And Jesus says, I'm the light that penetrates the darkness, that the darkness can't overcome. So no matter what kind of darkness is enclosed uh, you in your life, I can break through that and offer you uh, uh, light and life. I am the door for the sheep may be uh, uh, an invitation for those who feel unworthy, uh, wonder if they're good enough to gain entrance to the sheepfold. And Jesus is saying, I am the, I'm the gate, and I swing wide to welcome those. So just as you listen to my voice and respond, uh, he is more than happy to welcome them. Or he says, I am the good shepherd. And there may be those who feel a need to be loved, fed, led, protected, uh, to need 
uh, that kind of uh, care and to feel that they are being watched over and cared for. Um, so, or they may be uh, lost sheep and somehow have lost their way, maybe through sin, but not necessarily. Maybe they've just lost their way in life and need a shepherd who cares enough about them to go out and look for them and to bring them safely home. I am the resurrection and the life may be a word of encouragement for those who are, who perhaps feel like they are dead even though they're alive. Uh, their lives are empty or meaningless or shallow and they, uh, they are looking for life, uh, true life, abundant life. And Jesus says, I am that life and will offer you that life. I am the true vine can be a word of hope for those of us who feel our own weakness and realize that we need the strength of God joining with our strength uh, in order to become one strength. The branch needs to be connected to the vine and we feel our need for this. We feel our weakness, our inadequacy in ourselves and we uh, uh, this image of being attached to the vine and drawing our life and our power from, from the vine is a, is a helpful image for us. Uh, and the way and the truth and the life uh, for those who have lost their way or for who, those who know that their lives aren't authentic and true or for those who desperately need or want a new start in life. So uh, I invite you to explore these images this week to to dwell on them, to meditate on them, to think about uh, what they're offering to us and how they're speaking to us of the many ways in which God can come to be our salvation. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, claiming these uh, titles for himself, I am, and each one of them are fruitful images for our prayer and reflection. So I invite you to uh, Pray with these images this week and to and take each of them and try to unpack them and explore them for yourselves. Uh, next week we'll be picking up the story where we left off at the uh, end of the Last Supper and we're looking at the final days of Jesus, his arrest, and leading into his crucifixion. God bless you. Thank you for joining us in this course and we look forward to being with you in the next session.